Uh, welcome back, everybody. Thank you for those who have patiently waited. We hope and trust that the platform is now stable. And so we want to very quickly uh, get into the session. And I'd like to ask first uh, for a few short words from Zeger uh, for Kuterin, uh, who is the Vice President Worldwide Government Affairs and Policy for Europe, Middle East and Africa and Global Supply Chain at Johnson & Johnson, as well as uh, being on the Board of Directors for the J&J &J Foundation, which manages the company's community impact projects. So over to you, Zega, for a quick introduction. Thank you very much, Wayne, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, and really, um, it's, it's, it's really exciting to see that there is a session on this summit around uh, SDG on health and well-being, such an important topic. And at Johnson & Johnson, we believe that we are made for times like this, but the current pandemic has made this notion a painful and unescapable reality to each and every one of us and touching every single dimension of our work and our livelihoods and at a scale otherwise unseen in our lifetime. So part of our work in public health, which has been very broad and longstanding, we're also committed to improving the lives throughout the COVID-19 crisis. And as the pandemic has placed a major strain on healthcare and individuals and communities, but also beyond uh, the education, the jobs and the wider economy. It could be not more pertinent to address these gaps and the way we approach systemic issues related to health and well-being through learning opportunities like this one today. And in this session, we will really attempt to break through the silos and make take this multi-level approach to resilience from the individual level to the community level, all the way to the systems level, exploring how they are intrinsically connected. Today, we're joined by leaders that are assessing these levels, proactively bridging gaps and learning through COVID how to better build a more resilient world for all of us. So with this in mind, we welcome moderator Professor Wayne Visser and our distinguished panelists, Sonia van Lishout from Randstad, Céline Chaveria from the Institute of European Environmental Policy, Hilde de Man from IDEWE, and my colleagues from Johnson & Johnson, Marion Bernstil and Anouk van Hooydonk. So over to you, uh, Wayne, and success. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we're testing all of your resilience as well. So if you're still with us, uh, we're delighted. And I just wanted to frame uh, the topic a little bit. So um, if we just go to the first slide, uh, it's important that we see resilience as a multi-level phenomenon. And uh, there's a picture here depicting social and ecological resilience. If you look at these aspen trees in Colorado, in Colorado when there is a, an avalanche, then in fact, after the avalanche, they stand back up because they are flexible, they're supple, uh, they don't break, and they're connected underground by a root system that supports each other. If we look at the second uh, uh, level of resilience, if you could click for me, please then uh, we of course also have organizational resilience and i just put a picture here of uh, one of the oldest organizations in the world a japanese organization that uh, dates back to 578 a.d so resilience is about uh, our social organizational and community uh, structures as well and there are various uh, characteristics associated with that level and then of course we also have the individual level if you could click again for me then uh, uh, this is really about whether we uh, as individuals can survive and thrive through crises and uh, through disruptions. And when we do frame sustainability as we're doing in this uh, summit, and we talk about the sustainable development goals, it's important to know that uh, resilience is one of the threads that goes throughout that uh, discussion. And we're going to dive, of course, into one element of this, which is uh, looking at health and well-being. And so uh, I'd like to uh, introduce our first panelist now.
Um, if you could just click on for me. Um, you see there, uh, just before we do that, we did a, a national survey and uh, we actually asked people how they feel right now uh, during COVID-19. And uh, interesting that most individuals feel as resilient as they did before and feel that their organizations and the Belgian society may actually be slightly more resilient. And so that suggests that we also learn through crises. Next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to mention that we're doing work with Runstat, and Runstat is on the call today. Uh, uh, Sonia has joined us. Uh, and we've, uh, based on research, framed 10 elements of resilience. And we will be uh, touching on some of these today, uh, most notably well-being uh, orientation. But once again, all of these are connected. So now I think uh, I'm able to introduce our first panelist. Um, next slide, please. And again, next slide, please. Uh, okay, we've got uh, a different order. So I'm introducing now Hilda de Munn. So you may just have to check your slides there and queue, queue those up for, for us. Um, so uh, Hilda is a head of the Department of Psychological Wellbeing at IDEWE, um, external service, and she's been working in partnership with Johnson & Johnson to support healthcare institutions during the COVID crisis. And her focus is on psychological wellbeing at work on an individual team and organizational level. So I know you have a few slides, Hilda, but really to kick us off, my question uh, is, how are people doing at the individual level? What has been the impact, especially of COVID-19? How are people coping? Uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, I'll start my camera, maybe. OK. Um, well, uh, if we look back to the first wave of the crisis, um, it seemed that people were more resilient than we thought they would be. Um, I, I will explain this. And I'm also convinced that we all learned now to respond in a more flexible way to continuously changing situations on the work floor. But I do am concerned now about the long-term effects of this crisis in developing chronic stress diseases. Um, what we did, we had, um, maybe next slide. <laughs> um, we, um, we organized a community project with in partnership, partnership with Johnson & Johnson, where we offered from um, June on, we offered free access to an online tool about stress coping for healthcare and to an online tool about anxiety. And we also offered individual online support and extra group support for teams in 21 elderly houses and youth welfare. And um, we also know that the support from team leaders and colleagues is rated as highly important in these disruptive times. So therefore, we also organized supervision with team leaders and made some tools to lead a team debriefing about resilience and coping and for giving individual support. Um, does anybody can hear me? OK. <laughs> um, well, what we learned, um, why was this project an extra investment help? Uh, was, was this project and the extra investment helpful on the right time? Um, that we can conclude uh, out of a study in healthcare. There was a study in healthcare from the University of, Le of Louvain, uh, which, which shows that acute stress reactions and hyper alertness and fear have decreased since April. But nevertheless, exhaustion, concentration problems, sleep deprivation, and unhappy feelings are already as high rated, highly rated as uh, in April. So um, one good story about resilience, because the, the acute stress reactions diminished or decreased, but um, the exhaustion on the long term is now very high rated. And we also um, noticed that social support and, and in, in the study and feeling meaningful in the job and work outcome in October. And uh, another nice finding is that, uh, nice, not, not so nice, but we, we, 
we had the finding that um, where 10 percent of the health workers thought they would need support from a psychologist in june in october already 26 of the per percent of the respondents said that they would need further help so it is now time to give support to these people in healthcare. And the respondents also mentioned that they expected most of the support from their own team leaders. So it was good for us to help and support the team leaders in, uh, in, uh, in tools and give support to their, for giving support to their employees. So what we um, can, can conclude is that the need for psychosocial support seems to be more needed now than in the beginning of the crisis. So it was now the time to help. So Hilda, if I could just ask you then, um, so what have you seen? Uh, what's been working well do you, and, and what's, uh, what's not been working well? Okay. Um, well, that's for the next slide. Well, um, we learned from ourselves in, in the first crisis, we offered online consults and for medical and psychosocial needs. But uh, at that time, the questions were more on the medical um, medical level, so there were not so many um, questions about um, the psychosocial needs. So there, we noticed that there was a threshold. So the threshold to reach out for help seemed higher than expected, as they they all worked now on an adrenaline and had no free time to call and experienced more support from their colleagues and friends at that time. So. Um, we saw that people who did call were mostly employees with feelings of fear as they were, they were, there was less protection at that time and feelings of guilt in not being able to help their colleagues when they had to stay um, home. But offering, and, and we also saw that uh, offering support on the work floor itself where the hard work was going on was more effective, more effective than online uh, calls, which is, uh, which has a broader, uh, uh, which has broader distance. So group support was more needed in June than online support. So we did more group support and it was more effectively in elderly houses where we already offered, all, offered individual support in real life, just in the beginning of the crisis that, uh, that we could conclude. And um, also we saw that facilitating group support in letting express all their different feelings and in making time to look back to a period where moral ruins and moral dilemmas were made was highly appreciated, appreciated, appreciated by um, all the participants. So in the midst of the crisis, help at the workplace itself was more effective than online support. That's what we learned um, from our support. and. Um, I can give you also the conclusions we, we see now, what is uh, different in the, in the healthcare at this moment. So the next slide, please. So um, now we see that there, there is less fear in healthcare than in the beginning, as there is more protection and more experience. There are more protocols of working and more testing. Um, I'm also a prevention consultant at the big hospital in Louvain, and they, they now said that um, asking for volunteers now to work on the COVID sections worked much better now than in the beginning where they had to push them without agreeing to, to work at the, uh, at the COVID sections. And um, they also learned that it was very important to end the work on a COVID section with a ritual, with a closing, because um, going back to normal work in their in their normal teams had been a too disruptive process from getting to the COVID, COVID sections to their normal teams. And they learned that the briefings afterwards, um, after the hard, hard working weeks were, were highly appreciated, appreciated and, and, it, it, and it worked. Huh? So the briefings were very important. And um, Especially, we noticed that teams where the manager gave support at that time, they now have a strong tie and strong bond after the first crisis. But teams where the leader was not visible at that time, uh, now um, had, it very, had it more difficult to regain trust and uh, communication with good communication with their manager. And um, healthcare, organ but, but what we see is a, is a good result is that, that healthcare organizations are now, now being forced to work together 
and um, also first line workers, as we are also, we learn to know each other better on the field and can refer now very um, now better to each other accordingly to the spe specific needs they have. And um, I also see that hospitals learn that psychologists psychosocial support has to be given nearby the work, workforce. And that's the difference we see now uh, at this time in the second wave. And uh, also a good result is that, that in no time we saw that there was a new website for all care workers. It was set up with helpful tools now in collaboration with several partners on the field who are working now together for the first time. So I think we will, um, we will uh, have that um, uh, it, will, it will be a result on, on the long term also that we can uh, collaborate much, much more. Thanks, Hilde. There's some real uh, insights there into what's happening on the ground. Um, I'd like to come uh, next uh, to our panelist, Anouk van Hoydonk. And uh, Anouk is uh, leading the Healthiest Careers program within J&J &J Belgium. Uh, she leads the strategy and rollout of career coaching and career support to both employees and uh, people leaders. And I'm pleased to say that after a 17-year career in uh, in finance, she came over to the light side of uh, of uh, human resources and has been working in in this field for a number of years at J&J. So, um, Anouk, welcome. Uh, do you see similar trends, uh, similar um, similar things on the ground i mean you you're obviously in an organization dealing with this day to day uh, what have been some of your insights on the resilience at an individual level yeah yeah and of course we have been working very closely with uh, our partners like edv to provide the mental support for our employees as health and the health of our employees is certainly important now as well and as you were showing Wayne in the beginning, um, satisfaction and meaningfulness is very important for individuals with regards to resilience building. And that's, I think, also the thing where we do build upon for years, but actually has been even becoming more important, like giving people, our employees, job satisfaction, job progress, because that's also giving them the needed resilience, both from an individual perspective to their homes, their families, but also for, for our business to make the progress there. Of course, we do have some hurdles to encounter um, because the workplace is changed. So many of us are working uh, from home, are not meeting their colleagues on a day-to-day -day basis anymore. Um, they are struggling to disconnect from work. Um, so I think there it's the question, how can we make sure if we evolve Further on, how can we make sure that we really do change the way we work and how we work so people can balance that flexibility need, but also make sure that we can keep on uh, delivering our business and supporting there. I think another question, if we look towards job content and job questions, um, there the question is with all of the changes that we see right now and the acceleration of, for instance, like digitalization, what kind of jobs become obsolete and how do we prepare uh, people there? Um, and then, yeah, another element maybe um, that we of think that we see do is important is with regards to making sure, sure that we do prepare our people for the future and learning these new competencies. Um, but actually these competencies are coming in right now and people are just managing their day-to-day -day business so how can we make sure that they also think about uh, about the future and not just uh, not just the here and now and uh, also what hilda was saying just what, how can we make sure that we do support our people is because these are also just human beings having their day-to-day -day job but how can we support them to make sure that they can also build the resilience in to in their teams, which there is a big, di totally different way of uh, working together. Um, some hurdles, but I think also a lot of opportunities. Um, and that's what you can see uh, on the next slides. Um, we were talking about flexibility, giving people different ways to work. I think the telework in the future can become one of our flexibility strongholds that we can give to our employees. And on the other side, also make sure that people can still connect with their colleagues. 
Um, and that's something that we will build on into the future. So how can we make sure that people can, if they come on site, that they can meet in teams and um, do it one to one connections. So because that's also from a resilience building, the social connection there is really important. Um, as we were saying, making sure that our people feel ready for the future, it's about also making sure that they have the right competencies. So there we've seen now the opportunity to build and co-create together with uh, uh, some academic partners, but also with our business leaders to make sure that the people leaders are ready for the future. Again, it's exciting times to start this off, but uh, I think there is a lot of urgency now. So and I think that's the opportunity that we do pick. Uh, also with exchanging um, the learning opportunities, uh, how can we make sure that um, we maybe exchange talents across companies, across academic institutes or secondary schools so that we give new opportunities both for our own employees, but also how can we bring in new knowledge and new experiences? And I think again there, COVID has maybe pushed us somewhat further on. And um, I think also here, building there the new jobs for the future, it's, it's a, a really nice thing. Um, what we learned so far is actually that giving people career coaching, starting people up to think about their jobs, their careers, actually gives them more, a better feeling on their own well-being as well as self-confidence. So again, now in these uncertain times and towards the future, we just need to make sure that we can hold on this uh, on this topic. And then just, uh, yeah, of course, uh, it's not always easy for people to work in this new setting, in this new team. So we do support our also our teams with some tools, with some support in hybrid working, in virtual working, or the people who are on the site. Um, and yeah, like the collaboration we have with ID, IWE, it's, it's actually the access and the easy access to the broad offering that we give to our individuals, to our employees, I think actually has been giving and really pushed it to the front of the organization, uh, which I think is um, very nice as well. So maybe as a final notes, um, it's on the next slide, we always talk about four dimensions, saying actually you have to learn, you, you work, you have to care, take care of people around you and then take the rest. And I think it's about building that resilience. It's different for everyone. It's giving attention, energy to these dimensions who actually needs the right um, or, or need more attention. And we always say in an open dialogue um, with your partners at home, depending, but also with uh, the leaders in the organization. So that's actually also the mo a model that we will bring more and more towards the organization to build that resilience and to build that actually engagements and work content towards the future. Thanks, Arnott. Uh, some really uh, useful thoughts there. I just wanted to ask you, I mean, you're dealing with this now before the crisis, building yes. resilience, looking after people's job satisfaction and careers and so on, and you have these approaches. Um, and then now, in the midst of the crisis, what would you say is the main difference? I mean, what have you had to emphasize more now or really give uh, uh, more attention now? And how, how are people coping differently? I think it's, I think maybe it's two things. First of all, the acceleration of things will change, change, jobs will change. We will need new competencies, so we have to act now to be ready. I think that's certainly one. And I think the other one is it's this picture, eh? balancing that I think COVID has learned or pushed us in giving more balancing out all of the different dimensions, responsibilities that we do have as, a, as an individual uh, in society, in our organization, as part of a family. Okay, thanks very much. I'd like to bring in um, Marion Bernstein now, and uh, Marion works also for Johnson & Johnson, but for the foundation uh, across Europe, Middle East and Africa, and she's uh, advocating for new ways of partnering with the belief that uh, collective action and impact approaches are needed to drive transformation and systemic change. She's also been exploring how best to invest in resilience at individual, community and health system levels, uh, to shift from curing bad health to sustaining good health. So, Marion, we, we're shifting a little bit now. We've looked quite a bit at the individual, 
but of course resilience has to happen at the community level as well and uh, there are different ways also to approach community health so could you share some thoughts with us uh, of, of what you're doing what's working what what's not working thank you that's great no um big thank you for um, holding space for that multi-level perspective and really to start holding space for complexity and thinking about the individual level, the community level and the system level. They're so absolutely interlinked. And before I start, may I ask that we remove the slides? I actually don't have slides and as much as possible, I would love to see you all. Um, so. I think it's no surprise for uh, quite a few of you that currently we have 400 million people that have no access to health services at all, and 2 billion people that have only very limited access to basic health uh, services. So the foundation's belief is really that community health and primary care are really the cornerstone of a resilient and strong health system. But as we heard before, uh, there is no health system without the health workforce. And that's really the key for the future. Um, and currently, we still have a lack of 18 million health workers that are missing uh, by 2030. And we get a sense that health systems have been historically designed to keep, um, they've been really designed to respond to disease and not keep people healthy. Um, they're not really designed yet to reach out to people. Um, and that's really the opportunity of community health. And if I have to take a bit of a metaphor about what we see as the opportunity of community health, I would say there is a little waterfall metaphor and analysis that um, is the introduction to a book called The Upstream Doctor. And the analogy is the following. Two doctors at the bottom of a waterfall trying to save children from drowning and they keep pulling the kids out at the bottom of the waterfall until one of them says, I will go at the top of the waterfall and see why kids are falling in. And that's a little bit the opportunity uh, that we see that that's the belief behind community health. It's a mean to foster more resilience, to go more upstream and to shift our perspective to one that is closer to people, that is that are health services that are closer to home, uh, more holistic, more human-centered, more grounded in that belief that um, we can nurture resilience as opposed to curing disease, empowering people as citizens to own and manage their own health as much as possible. There are many opportunities around community health for us to learn from a kind of reverse innovation. Quite a few countries across sub-Saharan Africa um, our best practices and have been establishing community health delivery model. Uh, Ethiopia is one of them, Liberia is another, and there's a lot of opportunity for us to learn what would it take and what are the design principles that are behind community health. There are also a lot of economic modeling that have come, and that, that have, um, come to the forefront lately, making the case for community health and seeing that $1 invested in community health means ten dollars saved for the health system by being more upstream we find ways to make the system more financially viable and more sustainable if i want to take an example of um, what would a community health model look like one that we have been um, engaged with is um, mental health uk that is that has been for quite a few years piloting uh, a model of community mental health navigators and these are people almost like coaches that target severe mental health patients and really look at their holistic resilience, looking obviously at their mental health status, but looking at their physical health, their housing situation, employment situation, and financial capability situation. What, what uh, we see is that severe mental health patients enter less in crisis, they're less in hospital, and they really um, have a positive trajectory to, towards increasing their health outcome. And at the same time, what we're trying to prove with this model is that there are an economic benefit to the health system. And through such community uh, health models, we really manage to alleviate some of the burden on the health system. But there's obviously a lot of the gaps that are left out there. 
Um, one of the gap is we don't know what we don't have enough visibility on the community health models that um, that are proven to function. Uh, there's quite a few models out there, but we really don't know which one are the ones that work in mature markets. How might we go about establishing community health as a way to task shift a lot of the um, a lot of the service delivery out of the primary care setting? Uh, we also lack ways to codify what works. Why does it work in a rural area versus an urban area? Can we find design principles that make us understand what community health models are all about and what makes them work in one setting versus another? And finally, I think that there is a big gap in understanding the financial case for community health across Europe. How might we start articulating, obviously, what are the proven models? But these models that have proven to improve health outcomes, can we put some figures and some economic modeling, understanding how do these models actually uh, provide economic value to the, to the broader health system? So as you see, there is really a shift in the value that we place in health, shifting away more and more from the kind of hospital setting to the home setting, shifting more and more from the disease perspective to the resilience perspective. Um, and the delivery model is also changing and COVID has really accelerated uh, some of that. It has really brought us to, as painful as it was, to hold each one of us accountable and make us responsible for managing and owning our own health as much as possible. But also demonstrated the importance of having hyper local community health delivery system that were way closer to home and were more uh, effective. We also saw opportunities for pharmacists to play a role as community health providers in some countries. So there are quite a few models out there and we have yet to understand what are the best ones and how do we approach them? How do we make the case? And that's a little bit why I want to commend today's conversation as difficult technically as it was to really hold space for having a difficult conversation to which we don't have the answers but at least we start raising the right questions. Thanks very much. I'm gonna come in a moment to Celine, but I just wanted to ask a follow-up uh, to you uh, very shortly, Marin. Uh, have you seen areas in your work where the community health system that was prepared before COVID is now paying off during COVID? Thanks, yes, um, actually, as part of the kind of foundation's um, response to COVID, we had to go through our full portfolio of partnership and pivot most of our partnership to make them relevant during the COVID backdrop. A lot of the partnership that we have around community health had to be rethought. But what was interesting is that that hyper-local structure and that basis for health delivery mechanism was already there. And, um, you know, I mentioned the work that we're doing with Mental Health UK. We've basically pivoted and instead of having community mental health navigator, these became uh, COVID-19 navigators, transversal. So what we are trying to move away from is community health is a transversal way to lay the foundation for a productive health system. We are trying to move away from disease specific delivery mechanism to something that holds true regardless of the challenge that a country or a local community is facing. It's really harnessing the power of the community and making sure that they can um, match whatever challenge they're facing, being a pandemic, being some mental health issues. The, the idea is to have a little bit of uh, uh, you know, to inverse the pyramid in some ways of what the health system currently looked like and have an army of health providers. And I don't say health care providers, I say deliberately health providers that are, you know, delivering various um, services to the community, regardless of the, the topics and the needs. All right, thank you very much. So we've looked a little bit at the individual level, we've looked uh, at the organizational and the community level. And I'd like to shift a little bit now to the system level. And I'd like to come to Celine uh, Chaviaret. And I probably say your name completely wrong uh, with, with no French. Um, but uh, uh, Celine uh, is uh, executive director at the Institute for European Environment Health, uh, Environment Policy, IEEP. 
uh, and uh, began her career in Washington, D.C. as a researcher at the Peterson Institute and at the Inter-American Development Bank. And uh, she worked uh, for over 10 years at Oxfam International, where she became director of advocacy and campaigns and represented them at uh, the World Trade Organization and managed also its Make Trade Fair campaign. And uh, why I think it's so interesting bringing you into the conversation, Arsaline, is that when we think about the broader system that we're part of uh, and how that influences um, health and well-being, of course, it's not only health directly. We have to think about social issues. We have to think about economic issues and also environmental issues. So based on some of your work, how do you see these linkages within the, the broader system? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Wayne. And I have some slides, so can someone put the first slide up, please? Well, I mean, I'm going to share right now some of the outcomes of a project, research project that is ongoing and that we hope to publish uh, in the next uh, two months. And it's really to look at uh, the role at a systemic level that a healthy environment plays as a key factor for societal resilience, but also a key factor for individual resilience. And we already know very well the risk that climate change and other forms of environmental degradations play in terms of causing threats to our physical or our financial capital. You can see, for instance, the increasing uh, costs linked with natural uh, disasters. But here I'm going to look more specifically at the human capital. And we can see here a number of uh, uh, different uh, uh, determinants uh, of health, of mental health specifically, because here we focus on mental health, coming from environmental degradation, whether it's outdoor air pollution, climate change. And here I would like to highlight that it's both uh, eco-anxiety, uh, which uh, now is being identified very much among uh, children and adolescents, but also the impacts of extreme weather events, which have particular uh, uh, negative impacts on uh, the elderly in terms of post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, as well as general anxiety. Urban environment, uh, especially uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, poor indoor air quality, lights, uh, crowding, uh, linked often to the urban environment, noise pollution, and this is probably something that is very much overlooked, both in terms of environmental policy and health policy, but yet this is where there is the strongest evidence in terms of negative impact on health. Chemical pollutants and pesticides, as well as other forms of pollution, whether it's metals or microplastics. So we can see that really environmental degradation has a major impact on the disease burden and also an individual resistance, because, uh, resilience, because often people who are subjected to those negative impacts have other socioeconomic uh, sources of vulnerability. Uh, we can see that many people who have a lower socioeconomic status are also the most exposed to pollution, uh, most then uh, uh, affected by mental health issues, as well as physical health issues linked with the environment. Next slide. But there's also a nicer story uh, that shows that there are major benefits linked with increased access to green spaces and nature. And all uh, the elements that I'm putting here are based on medical research. And that goes to what Marion was saying about the importance of prevention. And I call this nature as a preventative medicine or as a, you know, a promotional health um, uh, measure. And you can see reduction in chronic stress, increase in self-esteem, reduction in self-reported anger, positive contribution for treatments of depression and anxiety, increasing community cohesion. And the last element is that we see that there are very specific and concrete uh, impacts specifically for children and adolescents, and especially in low-income uh, status segments of the population. So the final slide is really about Final slide is really about, okay, where do we go from this? Um, and I think the first thing to say is that we need to have a recovery model which looks at people, planet, and prosperity. Um, and that creates 
resilience by design in a phase of continuum of crisis, because we will have health crisis at the same time as environmental crisis, and unfortunately, very often at the same time as an economic or financial crisis, which means we need an integrated approach for economic, social, including health and ecological resilience. It's really important within recovery plans to put investment to create a green care economy, which both uh, enhances well-being as well as uh, allows for a healthier environment and planet. Putting the furthest behind first, because I said they have compounded vulnerabilities and as well as lack of access to green space is really important. Progress towards a toxic free environment as a key pillar of the European Green Deal so that there is less uh, instances of uh, dangerous chemicals being released into the environment. Restoration of ecosystems as a way to build uh, uh, and, and, and regenerate uh, nature and uh, facilitate access to uh, everyone, but including uh, those who have uh, health problems. And then last but not least, um, there is a big discussion about what constitutes good economic, social, and environmental performance by member states. And it's really important that in the European semester, uh, which is the process uh, that we use to assess this good performance of member states, we look at the sustainability scoreboard. And in our view, that should include both well-being as well as environmental indicators which for the moment are lacking right now we mostly have health but very classical health i would say indicators uh, and uh, pure economic indicators within the semester thank you thanks selena just wanted to follow up with one question i mean i, I wonder how you see it whether you think COVID-19 will be a positive tipping point for us taking into account many of the environmental issues, or is it going to go the other way? You've already pointed to some uh, some paradoxical effects. I mean, on the one hand, I think many people have actually got back in touch with nature during this time, during lockdown. We've seen nature bouncing back in many instances, clearer skies, clearer waters, uh, wildlife coming back into cities. Uh, on the other hand, uh, and then of course, uh, we've seen some drop in emissions. It's, it's uh, expected to be about 7% drop in carbon emissions this year compared to last year. On the other hand, we've seen uh, single-use plastics uh, bouncing back in the wrong way. Uh, suddenly, everything's, uh, we've got throwaway masks, throwaway gloves, uh, food packaging is again uh, wrapped in plastic. So I'm just wondering how you see it. Do you, do you see more uh, that it's uh, actually getting us to really rethink uh, our, our relationship with the environment or uh, is it uh, having the opposite effect? Well, I, I certainly think that uh, overall uh, it's really getting us to rethink our relationship with the environment. And as you pointed out, I think in those countries where confinement meant that people had no longer access to nature this was felt particularly uh, it, it really created a lot of suffering and i think people as soon as they were able to go back to nature had this instinct of going back to nature so i think that's very positive but clearly in a recession context uh, what is usually uh, stopped first or put to side first uh, are you know what are perceived as long-term long threats which of course we don't believe it's a long-term threat it's a present threat terms of environmental degradation. So I think there's a risk that in the name of restarting uh, growth, uh, lots of brown uh, investments or neutral, but certainly not green, will be prioritized as part of recovery plans. And unfortunately, uh, the, the, the initial evidence we have is that, you know, we are not bouncing forward, we're bouncing back and we're bouncing back to pollution and to fossil fuel uh, use, which clearly uh, we, we think it's the wrong way to go because we don't have time anymore, given what science is telling us, to bounce back before we bounce forward. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting, isn't it, whether we will have a green recovery. I mean, certainly we've seen with some of the fossil fuel companies uh, like BP uh, saying that they will produce 40% less fossil fuel by 2050. That's partly as a res result of COVID-19, they say and the demand for oil going down and also the demand for renewables going up right now. So it'll be one to watch. 
this is part of a, a, a bigger system, of course, and I'd like to come to, uh, uh, to Sonia van Lieshout now. Um, and Sonia is uh, the global public affairs manager for Randstad and uh, is responsible for advocacy on sustainability. And uh, next uh, to this, she's uh, elected also into the executive committee of the World Employment Confederation Europe and chairs their public affairs committee and uh, is also uh, been involved in the uh, yearly publication called Sustainability at Work, which was launched in April, which I also uh, um, had the pleasure of contributing to. And uh, Sonia, part of the larger system when we talk about resilience, of course, is that we definitely can't solve these issues on our own. We need to look at a, a larger health system, but also we need to look at partnerships. And so do you have some insights for us on that? I know uh, through some of your your work, you're working also at that European level. Perhaps you could share some of that with us. Thank you, Wayne. And indeed, I think listening to all of the previous uh, presenters and panelists, I think if one thing becomes clear also within this COVID-19 pandemic situation is that we need partnerships um, and not only sectoral partnerships, but also cross-sectoral and intersectoral partnerships. And if my slides can be put on the screen. Yes, exactly. Then here you can see an example of a new partnership, which is called All Policies for a Healthy Europe. And moving over to the next slide, you will see that um, our mission is actually uh, that intersectoral initiative in order to really, um, yeah, to see how we can contribute to the health and well-being of the European citizens and making it really at the heart of the center of the European policymaker. We know from research that 70% of the European citizens want to see more action on um, European level on health and well-being. And I think that's even increased during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic situation. So if we move over to the next slide, I will show you what we stand for. So we are working uh, with the strategic clusters focusing on three elements, environment, of course, one of them, but also economy and the digital uh, cluster forms. Um, uh, yeah, the basis of, of our partnership. And we're really focusing on uh, what um, President von der Leyen has been saying that we need to strive for a union that is more climate neutral, but also socially inclusive, um, and of course a digital Europe. Because without digital, the use of digital uh, tools, you know, we cannot make that uh, step forward into the future. I would say. And if we move over to the next slide, I can show you which partners all are involved at the moment within this All Policies for a Healthy Europe partnership. It's of course Johnson & Johnson, but also Philips for that matter. And we have a couple of other corp, uh, knowledge partners which are mentioned on the slide as well. Now, of course, looking at this, um, we all know that we need this integrated and, and uh, holistic approach in order to move forward to, uh, to yeah, a European policy making, um, but also and looking at the UN SDGs, I think that, you know, partnership uh, is the most important one in order to achieve this. We know this as Randstad as well, and we take this very seriously, I need to say. Um, if we look at um, what we have been doing since uh, the breakout of COVID-19, we have been able to place 140,000 people back into work. So that's only the people coming from being um, unemployed during the COVID-19 pandemic situation. It's not even talking about uh, the people that we are um, moving um, or transitioning from work to work via reskilling and upskilling. And we have plenty of examples of those. Uh, cabinet attendants that we um, have reskilled and upskilled to care workers, for example, being frontline workers, but also truck drivers working at an airport and we have been able to, uh, to place them to other sectors, for example, the food and logistics sector, also the frontline workers uh, within the, the COVID-19 pandemic situation. And as you rightly mentioned, Wayne, um, we have gathered all of these initiatives and examples in a yearly study, which we call Sustainability at Work. You can download it at onestop.com website. And we have had the pleasure of collaborating with, uh, with you, Wayne, uh, you contributed to this uh, first 
edition of Sustainability at Work um, with an article on sustainable transformation. So all the more reason to, yeah, to really look at all the available information out there. And I think you've heard plenty of examples uh, throughout this session. So yeah, let us follow up on that part, I would say. Thanks, Sonia. Just uh, coming back to you then, um, you're emphasizing partnership and we're at an SDG summit. And so actually a question to you, but also to others on the, on the panel is uh, we're leading this session obviously uh, with SDG three on health and well-being, but uh, where do you see the other linkages to the other SDGs? Uh, uh, I mean, you've given us a nice example here now. So how how are we starting to make this uh, both the partnership and the collaboration and the the systems thinking perspective uh, real through collaboration? Uh, what are some of the other SDGs you see the links with? Well, I can only talk for my own company, of course, uh, for that matter. But if I look at Wanstad, we adhere to the SDGs number four, number five, number eight on decent work for that matter, but also number 10. Um, and I can uh, tell you that we are well aware of the fact that this is a joint responsibility. We cannot do this alone. We don't even want to do this alone. So this is all the more reason why we entered um, the All Policy for a Healthy Europe Alliance because we are truly aware of the fact that only if we can work together, we can create that sustainable future for all of us and um, a sustainable and inclusive future, I should say, a world where we can all thrive in. So for me, partnerships is the linking pin to all of the other SDGs for that matter. Okay, thanks. So I'd like to open up uh, to the rest of the panel again and um, if any of you would like to jump in with a, a comment, otherwise I'll come to you individually. Yes, uh, Marion. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry. Yes, I think the, there is a, also an intimate link to poverty and health inequalities. Um, it's, it's extremely linked and tackling health cannot be tackled in isolation. We need to think about people's livelihood and we see that with the COVID situation right now. Um, the second part is to be systemic, we need to keep zooming in and out. And I, I am not sure that we always have the best capacity and tools and methodology to think through systems and to think through what does it take and what are the best models to galvanize and mobilize collective action and collective impact. So there, there, there are also gaps on the how what are the best model and governance model for um, collective action and collective impact based partner, uh, partnership? And what are the tools and methodology for all of us to think and zoom in and out of a system being health or as we see here, more broadly interconnected. Um, and that is a little bit the difficulty of holding the space for those conversation. There is a, uh, quite a few levels of complexity and there is always the temptation to go broader to be holistic, but at the same time, we all need to remain focused on onto our, um, you know, delivering the impact. So I think those are probably skills and uh, skills for the future that we all need to acquire and we need to be better equipped to think holistically and to think systematically. Okay, thanks. Uh, Hilda, any, uh, how, how do you see this? How do, how do we make the links? I mean, you, you focused a lot at the individual level, but obviously this links to the community and the system level. Um, how do you see that? Uh, not so easy to answer. Um, I mean, I guess the question again is like, we see all of these SDGs here, and if we just say this is about health and well-being on its own, then probably we're missing the the system's uh, perspective. So, especially in your work with individuals, do you see knock-on effects in other parts of the, the system? Huh. We try to to um, hmm. we try to make conclusions um, out of the, the individual. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I have telephones. It's a, a bit uh, uneasy. Do you want to take care of that and I'll come back to you? Um, 
I'll just uh, oh, yeah. come come to Celine first, and then I'll come back to you. Yeah, so, Celine, uh, what are some of the connections you see, and and how partnership is helping us deal with this? Um, well, I mean, we we see uh, from from our end a lot of connections between what we would call the the well-being or human-centered SDGs, and obviously the environmental SDGs. And the way we look at it is by looking at how can we still ensure well-being while drastically reducing uh, our material footprint. By 2050, we estimate that we need to reduce the material footprint of each European citizen by 80%. And for that, you need to look at uh, four systems, nutrition, mobility, housing, and leisure. And are there win-wins where a specific action would be positive, both in terms of well-being, but also reducing uh, and the environmental footprint. I think there are many of those in uh, nutrition. And where will those uh, moments be where there is a clear dilemma? And how do we also create partnership and, and societal dialogue? And that's really the focus of se uh, SDG 17, which I think in Europe we don't spend enough time thinking about how that looks like so we can have those difficult conversations. And I think, you know, to me, one of the pluses of this a CSR summit is to try to bring different stakeholders to start having those difficult conversations, easy when it's a win-win, but more difficult when there's a trade-off or a dilemma between different SDGs. Yeah, excellent. Well, um, I'm going to start bringing it to a close now, and uh, everyone's been very patient with uh, our delays and our technical hiccups, but um, we started really introducing the, the cross-cutting capabilities of resilience, multi-level resilience, and relating that to health and well-being. And so the question I'd like to end with to, uh, to the panelists is, what is giving you hope right now? Do you, what do you see for a post-COVID period um, in terms of perhaps the resilience that we will have gained or uh, certain behaviors or changes that we've made? Uh, what's giving you hope for a post-COVID resilient society. And I'll come to you first, Hilda. Thank you, Wayne. Um, my hope is that team leaders will continue to pay attention to emotions, resilience and stress coping as they experience now in the crisis, the, the benefits of going in a one-to-one -one dialogue with their employees about these reactions and um, of organizing also group support. We hope that they have really felt that these efforts can result in a much stronger connection with their team now, and that this kind of attention will have effects on well-being and on, on team resilience on the long term. So that's my hope that um, team leaders will, will pay attention now to that uh, part of, of uh, what, is, what is happening in, with us uh, in times of crisis. Thanks, Hilda. Uh, how about for you, Marion? How do you see uh, hope post-COVID? I think there is a strong momentum uh, given uh, through COVID to hold space for that complex conversation. And the tension is going to be to allow for the short-term needs that COVID is bringing to the health system and the need for firefighting truly against the spread of COVID. But at the same time, to really make sure, and I, I get that feeling through various conversation on building forward better, that we need to invest now in the long-term transformation. So I see signal that the firefighting doesn't really eclipse the long-term transformation and the needs for long-term thinking. So that really creates a lot of hope. It's going to be a long road ahead, but if not now, when? So I think we really need to start build the transformation today and not let ourselves be completely taken in the in the firefighting. Thank you. And Celine, how do you see this? Well, I think what, what gives me a, a lot of hope is, is obviously this crisis has, has brought a lot of suffering, but it's also shown that there is a capacity for resilience and that there is also an enormous capacity for innovation uh, within communities, uh, because when all the systems started to break down or at least not function in the way that uh, we were used to, I think we saw many uh, wonderful initiatives and also 
sometimes people feeling that there was more cohesion in their community in the face of those crises. So I think we should be building uh, on this um, on this empowerment, so to speak, that uh, many people have probably felt uh, during this crisis, and and also this confidence that we can innovate and react and reinvent uh, ways of working, ways of living, uh, which actually would contribute to well-being rather than uh, reduce it in the end. Wonderful. And uh, Sonia, to you. Yeah, my hope for, for you know, a post-COVID-19 situation is actually that we can build upon the resilience that we have seen within that COVID-19 pandemic situation, which we are in right now. I mean, many of us never were, um, never experienced a crisis situation before, N not, you know, to the, to the scale of this size. Um, so I hope we can build on that uh, resilience that we have showcased during this pandemic situation but also really moving forward to that integrated and holistic approach in order to uh, to get to the ultimate goal which is health and well-being of all of course because only if we are healthy uh, and feeling well we can you know contribute to a well-functioning society and thrive uh, at last well thank you all and from my perspective i also am hope hopeful uh, largely because of uh, studying complex living systems and when i see uh, how the how they work and how they behave when we have such connected systems like we're part of right now uh, in society and with the environment uh, when we do get shocks to the system of course they they can tip us into breakdown but also into breakthrough so i really echo that innovation message i've seen an incredible amount of innovation during this period but i'm also hopeful because you know uh, the butterfly effect means that small changes in the system which are happening now um, small behavior changes small changes in the way we think and the way we see the world will be rippling through the system for years to come and we actually don't know uh, how that system will change but we know for sure that it's going to change and I believe many of those will be positive changes. I think it will speed our transition to a, a better, more inclusive and a more sustainable world. So uh, uh, we're gonna end it there. Thank you very much for uh, participating. To all the panelists, thank you. Um, and to all the participants who uh, resiliently hung in there with us, thank you also. And I wish you all a good day or a good evening, wherever you may be. Thank you, and we'll end the session now. Thank you, bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks, Wayne, for moderating us through this.